So thanks everyone for joining. Uh, welcome to today's sessions on training AI to code using the largest code data set called Project CodeNet. I'm Tommy. I'm a senior software engineer um, at IBM. I'm mostly focused on open source and open source technologies. And today we're going to introduce this new CodeNet data set about how to use you know, um, this new largest data set to help AI to tr train um, coding and help you enhance um, coding in a um, you know, day-to-day basis. So uh, we have seen, you know, languages is a very powerful tool, and we have seen NLP and a lot of the deep learning application help NLP to help um, make human communicate with machine very good. But however, we could also apply like, this kind of application to like code, um, like human coding application as well. So it could enhance, let's say, uh, how you fulfill your coding um, t um, lines and how you translating codes and also help you, you know, uh, simplify and summarize the code you have written um, for your programming language. And the concept of, you know, AI for code is actually help teaching machine, you know, uh, to actually code the language of machine as well. Just similar how, you know, we use NLP to code, like mach how much use machine to code human languages. So since, you know, like um, this field is still relatively new in uh, computer science, and it leverages a lot of the you know, traditional concepts like let's say NLP and document understanding. And more importantly, is able to understand you know, the code analysis and the uh, compilation uh, techniques they use before like, um, codings. And the goal one want to achieve with this data set is to actually automate you know, the software engineer process, uh, help them you know, uh, more proactive using this tool. Let's say uh, code and code to code translation could be um, some of the use cases with this um, data set. And with this kind of like um, use cases where we actually could like apply it to like a business use case such as you know converting legacy software um, to modern uh, code. So this way we could migrate you know uh, old legacy software much easily. And we look at like the machine learning fields right um, when we see back in 2009 when ImageNet was introduced there's 3 million images with 5,000 classes and in 2012, the, the number of images increased to like 14 million images and 22,000 classes. And with this kind of like amount of data sets, um, people were able to develop the, you know, new algorithms using deep learnings. And over the time, you could see within the five years of spams, uh, people could develop a model that able to like perform you know, human level tasks. So um, at 2005, with like the new um, like, deep learning frameworks, like it could actually like beat humans on particular um, like image-based um, classifiers. And uh, as we can see how, you know, like deep learning could help in, you know, image-based models, we want to also apply this for, you know, like um, code, right, a base model as well. So as we can see, like a lot of the old infrastructure, especially in like governments, uh, fields, we see like there's a lot of code still using COBOLs and it's the very big need to, you know, migrate them into a modern, you know, technology and using modern stacks. Um, this is why like we need to, be, you know, um, able to build like new models, able to help use code to translate into a modern code. And uh, if we kind of, you know, take a step back and look at how, you know, uh, uh, NLP has been uh, done back then, when the first, you know, DNN was introduced, uh, we start, you know, applying more, you know, human-based natural languages. And over the span of usually five years, we could see like as we put more, you know, compute powers and more data and with more research, like our researchers able to develop like better models and able to perform at the human level. So use within like five years spans. So what AI for code needs is like an ImageNet uh, light data set. Uh, that you could help, you know, do like code language translation, go search, go uh, similarities, you know, perform like go in uh, code performance improvement and able to enhance, you know, code uh, memory improvement and finally do like some uh, code classification as well. So now we introduce Project CodeNet. So Project CodeNet is one of the very big um, large data set that we have you know, introduced last year. It contains 14 million code samples and it it has like 4,000 plus uh, code problems and this covers, all the problem covers uh, 55 uh, programming languages and some we somehow have like uh, half a billion lines of codes. And this code is very diverse and 
uh, more importantly, it also includes a lot of test cases. So you actually could use them to verify uh, whether or not a code is actually running uh, well. And also, it will measure how much CPU and memory is being used. And more than anything, legacy code is very important. Um, for example, we could see like in modern mobile like kinds, there's a lot of you know code need to be rewritten um, you know over the decades. And rewritten the decades of code could usually take like years to finish. So we could see like one example when we apply the like, for code modernizations, when we build a model able to like help us uh, automate this kind of process. You know, moving like this decade of codes um, to a modern, let's say Java version, only takes four weeks versus a year traditionally. So now we kind of introduced, you know, the kind like the player set of um, project code net, but we also need to, you know, dive deep into like what AI system we could also apply. It. So uh, data scientists could actually build new tools and create new pipeline to automate, you know, um, all these models, and you know, able to help us create new new business value. Let's say convert legacy code into uh, modern code and help you know, boost developer uh, productivity as well. So now we let's dive into like, um, the different um, you know, um, languages that Conan have provide. Um, so you can see the distribution. Uh, most of the languages are based on you know, C, C++, Python, Java. Um, and it also includes a very old like legacy um, languages like COBOL, so you could actually do like you know legacy uh, code migrations. But as well as you have multiple versions of like Java's um, code as well with these submissions. So you could actually migrate from older Java version to a new Java version using like this kind of like um, uh, data set. And uh, as these data have 40, uh, 4,000 more problems. And 80% of those problems have at least 100 solutions for every language. And as you can see in the diagram, like more than 2,000 of the problems have more than 500 solutions for all those languages. So you can see like um, the solution is very diverse, and you can actually use this kind of like a data set to help you do a lot of you know, different kind of use cases. Um, then we can kind of break down where this data is actually coming from. So this data is actually mainly coming from the online church website, iJudge Online Church and Ad Coder. Um, so it has 4,000 problems and with 30 million submissions. Half of the submission are actually like categorized as accepts, so that means like uh, the solution is actually working for that particular problems. 30% um, of them is wrong answer, and then roughly 15% is rejected. Uh, and it has like 55 different languages. You know, more than 95% of them are in the main um, six languages, C++, Python, Java, C, Ruby, and C Sharp. And um, with C++ has the most common submission as 8 million um, submission in this case. And more importantly, you compare, you know, CoNet to the um, other, you know, uh, data sets out there like uh, GCJ and POJ. Um, CoNet had a significantly more amount of problems, more languages. Um, and more importantly, it includes a lot of test cases. So half of the problem have like you know robust test cases, and it has you know like um, measurement on memory run times and what kind of error it creates. So you can actually use them to calculate you know memory consumptions, runtime performance, and error prediction in this case as well. So in terms of like kind of metadata, um, so on a high level data set, you you know given like the name and the data set itself. Um, but more importantly, you have each problem, like each kind of category, you have the time limit, memory limits, and complexity for each problem. And when a user submit um, their submission to these problems, right, um, all, all each submission actually break down into like um, smaller chunks where you could see what language is being um, uh, submit, what the kind of uh, dates, um, the CPU time memories, and actually uh, accuracy on. Um, and the code size on like um, all these submissions, and then when the user actually submit uh, the code, it usually have like um, various amount of submission um, code er uh, code status, right? So not only you could um, see like code that is being passed, if all the test cases is being passed, you could also see like uh, what kind of error if a code uh, actually is not able to like um, pass uh, the submissions, right? So with this kind of information, we not only just know like if something is code incorrectly, but we also could know if something is like code inefficiently, right? You think uh, that costs a lot of runtimes or memory, uh, and we could also use those information to help you know create new models that 
um, focus on optimizing codes instead of just doing code translation and code generations. And uh, in addition to that, like uh, the CodeNet project also provides a lot of tools to help you navigate this kind of big data sets. So uh, uh, when, when, with, uh, aside from the data set, right, in the um, CodeNet uh, GitHub, we also provide a various statistic, as you can see, like the uh, breakdowns on how the code um, is being submitted and how much memory is being used. And also like uh, have uh, ways for you to like um, make selections. So we have different selections where, let's say you want to try out like um, language classifications or like um, like math-based models, uh, we have like subset of those data set that uh, selected for you, so you could actually start to explore with the subset data set and understand the code uh, the data set better before you actually jump into the whole um, you know big uh, thirty million submission data sets. And furthermore, we also provide you know codes for you to actually do you know basic kind of NLP tasks. Like let's say tokenizer to help you tokenize all of those codes, right? So you can actually know uh, how to um, mask them. And you want to do more traditional kind of NLP style uh, language model. We also have like uh, AST generation to build like uh, traditional abstract syntax tree to understand how the you know um, uh, the code language works. And also we also have like control and data flow graph to construct like code analysis, so you could understand like what kind of a CPU one time and have like a more detailed breakdown of how this code is being computed. Um, and we also provide some example you want to start with, um, you want to uh, just train a simple you know, deep learning models. We have you know, graph neutral network experiment, you could just create simple like GN and networks. Uh, and these two use case, we have provide the mass language models where you could able to mass a particular tokens of the, um, uh, of the submission and you should try to pray, uh, you know, predict that token. So let's say you mask like a parenthesis, you should try to you know, auto complete the parenthesis. So it will help you do like, let's say like code completion and code generation in, uh, in that scenario. Um, and we also have like some you know, notebooks that help you uh, solve how you, um, you know, create this mass language model and do some like language classification as well. And with addition to that, we want to, um, you know, open source, uh, we, we did open source this to let the world to able to create more potential use case. Um, so one use case we kind of like show is, you know, code classifications, but we also want to see like uh, how this could expand to, you know, like code similarity search, source code, um, source to source code translation. So we help us like um, translate into different languages, different like, um, you know, version of the language and also like optimize um, um, the language runtime as well. And you know, you see like some, some of the existing applications, the IBM AI for code stacks that we have provided is actually using um, the CoNet um, database behind the scenes where, as our source. And also uh, you look at the research paper for DeepMind Alpha codes, they also refer like CoNet as well, their training data as um, source. So you will see like CoNet is actually very useful and provide very useful test cases that you could you know, start and leverage it to build your own you know, um, code-based um, NLP models. Um, so for now, I'm just going to show you one you know, very simple demos on how you could leverage CoNet to build um, the um, mass language models. So let me... Make it, I think it should be good enough. So just a short introduction for this. So the last, uh, the mass language models, um, it's basically, you know, you have like a, let's say you have a piece of code. Um, this model is trying to, you know, mass different kind of tokens, right, within the models and try to guess is that token, where, can we generate a token that able to match that? So, uh, so this is kind of like the foundation on how you, you know, want to create like code generation, code translation, right, and code completions. Um, you want to have some like mass based model to help you guess what is the next code token going to be. So this is like one of the basic models that help you to do that. Um, so we're just going to go over this notebook to see like um, this uh, simple example, how we could leverage um, the data dataset. So once, the, the, in the first step, we're going to imp uh, in implement um, and, and import all the TensorFlows and all the necessary um, like Panda and NumPy libraries. And then now we're kind of like take a look at the data sets. Uh, in this case, we're focused on using the C language, uh, programming language, where we're in the CoNet. So we're actually taking just a subset of the CoNet data set to train it. 
Um, so as you can see, like the CoNet data set, right, uh, is like like multi terabytes of uh, data. Uh, but you could also take like a subset, right, as a sub selection that we have um, selected uh, for you to get started with. So one of them is the mass language model ones. Uh, this one is very pretty small. It's just like uh, several uh, kilobytes of code that still like contains like thousands of examples. Um, you could you know start with this and create your first you know mass language uh, models. And now we kind of break down with this you know subset of the um, CoNet datasets. Um, this is focused on the C language, so you can see like um, first of all, we want to prepare these datasets. One way we could do this is actually you know um, sort them into five token class. So in C, you have like keywords, functions, identifier, punctuations, and C preprocessor symbols, right? So we want to like uh, put them in this five you know token class. So we know like uh, what category of like syntax we want to generate. So next we want to actually um, create this text vectorizations right um, in in uh, cares. So uh, we have to be able to tokenize you know, every single you know uh, co uh, tokens right in in the code because right now when you get the code initially it's only just a text files. So you want to like tokenize it first, and later on we are um, going to. Uh, apply a masking on each of the um, tokens. So you actually could, um, in the model, you could, you could able to mask on different tokens and able to apply them uh, in your model weight. So this is just like kind of pre-processing and you know, mask the inputs uh, and labels. And once we uh, kind of like pre-process all the data, right, we could tokenize that we're able to mask them. Um, now we want to build like a very simple, you know, a bird-like model. So it's a uh, it's a simplified version of the bird models. Um, so this is just uh, the purpose of demoing how you could do like simple mass um, language models, and you could you know uh, make take this to a more advanced use case and train it on GPU as well. So with this, we're able to create a very simple um, you know bird layer. And then we're just going to train them, you know, like this uh, 50,000 examples, right, with like um, batch of 32, right, with five epochs. So once we train them uh, on, on a CPU machine, typical CPU machine, probably just see um, on a laptop, it takes around an hour. And uh, for this demo, we kind of see once it, it trained on five epochs, uh, the loss rate is kind of acceptable. So we kind of just stop that and for the purpose of this demo, we could just uh, have enough, you know, accuracy to, you know, to play around with. So once we train these models, now we could evaluate, right, um, like the accuracy of these models. So um, with this subset, right, um, uh, when we kind of train this with five epochs, with 50k examples, um, and we kind of like uh, have another 5,000 examples as our test cases. We're able to see like uh, some of the masking tokens, right? Uh, able to predict the top five examples. Uh, let's say if you have like, something missing, you would see like uh, you try to have like void tokens, right? Or you just have like empty tokens. That these are the five top categories you could predict. And with this kind of accuracy, right? You can see the top one accuracy is gets to like the ninety-two percent, and it would count like um, if the guess is right within the five guesses, is uh, actually close to ninety-nine percent. So. Um, this is actually very useful and it could help you, you know, uh, do like code completion and you extend these models um, into a more advanced use case. So with this, we know like, how, you know, data scientists could leverage this um, data sets to um, train and, you know, like develop on Jupyter Notebooks. But like how do, you know, data scientists are able to share their use cases or share their research, share their like uh, model development with other researchers, right? So they could actually uh, combine and leverage multiple models to create new use cases. So the next thing we want to introduce is the uh, platform called Machine Learning Exchange. It's one of the uh, incubator projects in LFAI. Um, the concept of you know, Machine Learning Exchange is to actually have a category of AI access. It includes you know, data sets, models, pipelines. So data scientists could create different kind of like models when you know, data scientists have pre-processed the data sets and, you know, um, create like new, new data set selection. They could also upload to this. And uh, at the very end, once, you know, the data scientists create a pipeline to help them automate all this process, this could also, you know, upload on machine learning exchange. So other data scientists could just take these pipelines and apply into their, um, you know, developments and 
uh, if the business use case is uh, uh, relevant as well, uh, the business user could also, you know, see this model is interesting, this pipeline help us, you know, create new business value, we could just take it and make it into productions. So uh, as you can see, you know, um, machine learning is changed, including multiple kind of um, data assets, mainly pipeline, data sets, notebook, and models. And behind the scenes, uh, machine learning exchange uh, is running on Kubernetes and OpenShift, right? And, and it's running in the microservice architectures. So um, as you can see over here, um, the main API layers is how hosting all the you know uh, assets that the assets upload like models, um, data sets, metadata, notebook metadata, etc. And if like uh, someone wants to just execute a pipeline and want to know how uh, all these assets leverage together, behind the scene we're using you know Kubo pipeline on Tectons. Uh, the reason we choose like the Tecton version of Kubo pipeline is because we also want to support you know OpenShift. So this help us you know able to run you know AI pipeline on multiple platforms and we also leverage uh, um, the serving engines right uh, so when you have a model it's been uploaded and you just want to try it out we also leverage the serving engine called KSERP it used to be a Q4, uh, Q4 project and now also moved to LFAI um, it's a serverless serving a model serving platform that runs on Kubernetes so everything you serve everything you run on you know machine learning exchange is actually running on Kubernetes and furthermore, so for data sets management, we also have like a new project called, um, uh, have a project called Data Shims that do like um, data management. So whenever you want to leverage uh, CoNet data sets that runs on Kubernetes, uh, behind the scenes, we leverage Data Shim to help us you know, cache the data sets on the cluster and then do uh, processing right, um, on the Kubernetes cluster. Um, and with this, we're going to introduce like the list of categories that we have on machine learning exchange. So by default, in the uh, um, the website we have host on Elf AI, um, we have list like this um, list of pipelines, you know, comp and pipeline components, model, data sets, and notebooks um, that we have verified and um, are able to run it um, uh, with uh, all the compliance um, um, complete. And as you can see, like um, the highlights we want to show here is the project code nets, right? Uh, we have the project code net as part of the assets, and we also have like several examples, uh, like, for example, the uh, mass language model and the code language classifier, right? Um, on machine learning exchange catalogs. So with this, let's um, me show you how you know machine learning exchange is um, being host and how you could leverage machine learning exchange, right? Um, to host your assets and share it with uh, you are data scientist. So if you go to a um, the public hosting website, um, go uh, mlexchange.org. So um, this is actually host under you know the infrastructure with LFAI and data. And with this website, you can actually like um, just view all the catalogs that we have available, and you could just see um, like let's say for project CoNet. You can just see like uh, where the data sets come from. You could see the whole data set uh, files. You could just download from here, and you could also see the list of selection we have created. Right. Um, so you just want a subset of the code net. This is the kind of subset of selection you could use for let's say doing uh, Python benchmarking, Java benchmarking, and we also have two you know um, data sets just for doing like um, mass language model and language classifications, and. Um, with the models, um, as you can see, we have a list of models, and we kind of focus on, let's say for today, we could focus on the CoNet language classifications. Uh, in, in this uh, models, right, the data science uploads, it also like lists on like, what uh, the data set is being used on this model. Uh, for example, right, um, in this case, you could see um, this one is using the project CoNet training data and using the uh, course classifications um, application examples. And also kind of show you, if you want to just run it on your local machine, it has like um, ways where you could just like deploy it on your local um, container register, uh, container runtimes. And if you have a Kubernetes cluster, you could just apply it directly as well. And the next asset we have is the pipelines. So behind the scene, we are leverage like Q4 pipelines uh, on Tacton to run this. So um, when, so, um, when someone have created a pipelines, they could actually just like um, 
register over here and able to run them. Um, if they wanted to experiment, you know, the AI pipelines, uh, how they run on Kubernetes and how you automate their um, life cycles, right? Um, as you can see, like it will create a deck and show you how to, um, you know, let's say manipulate, they like download two different kind of asset and join them together. And we, uh, for data scientists to want to build these kind of pipelines, uh, they will need to have like individual components that combine them together. Right? So as we can see, we have three different components over here. And if you want to just like uh, drag and, and use one of the pre-created components, we have a list of components over here you could uh, use. Um, and in this case, you can see that one of the examples is echoing like um, code file you find over here. And we also have like other um, like components to help you evaluate your you know uh, model robustness. Uh, you want to you know, check out like how you know LFA have other project how you do like um, air explainability. Like those are like the components how us automate those process. And we also have upload, upload them on machine learning exchange as well. And lastly, um, if uh, data scientists have like some development work, let's say they develop a model, uh, someone want to see how this model is being developed, they could just you know like upload their notebooks and show their development process. So the notebook we have just you know uploaded or uh, just have like check it out is the mo um, project Conet um, mass language models. As you could check it out here, um, we also have like the um, uh, uh, a server to help you, you know, visualize the, how, how the notebook code is being um, host. So you can see this is the exact same notebook we have like um, just ran uh, or just show like um, during the previous demo. And you could all check it out from the mlexchange.org over here. And this is like a uh, kind of like a hosted website so you cannot run anything in runtime because, um, it, because we cannot handle a lot of like uh, anonymous user. So uh, machine learning exchange, you can also run it on your private cloud or in your, uh, on your uh, own infrastructures. So in your own infrastructure, you could enable like admin runtime. So you can actually run models or pipeline and serve um, your model and test it out in your own infrastructure. So I have an instance that actually run on my own infrastructure. So in this case, let's say we go to models um, and enable like uh, admin, uh, like runtime assets. Uh, I could actually launch and serve this model on top of my Kubernetes clusters. So we'll simply just like submit. Uh, behind the scene, it will use the pipeline system to automate um, like where the um, model image is being located and actually serve it on top of my Kubernetes, right? Um, and automate this whole process for me. So first it will just like gather, you know, the, you know, the model config and know like where the model is being um, host. And then I'll, in this case, because um, um, the model is actually just an image, so we actually like, just take that image and create a Kubernetes deployment and actually host on my Kubernetes cluster. And after it creates the deployment, it actually also give me a, a deployment URL and create the services so I could actually use it and test it out. So once um, the model is being deployed, we can see like uh, this model actually include like, um, a Swagger API. So actually you could use this regular API to test out how this model works, right? So this model is actually a language classification models. Uh, it includes like 10 different you know, language categories. And to just simply try it out, you could just click on try it out and upload one of the language, uh, upload any you know, uh, language uh, coding files. So in this case, I could just upload a simple you know, uh, Python files right uh, over here. Uh, this is one of my self.pies in one well, of my SDK development. Um, when I upload this and execute, right, you could actually see like um, like this model able to uh, help me classify what language is this you know file is like. In this case, you could see like you know seventy two percent confidence is Python, and with some you know like um, twenty six percent dot is like um, Haskell, and then the rest is Java, right? So so you could see like um, and with this kind of use case, you could classify you know. Um, this code is Python, and then you can automate this. Oh, is this code is Python? That I could use do like Python, you know, auto um, code gen, uh, generation, etc. Right? Um, this is like kind of one of those use cases, and you could you know upload this kind of models to machine learning exchange and let other data scientists know this this kind of use cases. And if someone is interested and able to leverage it and expand it to a uh, you know more advanced business values, um, they could do so, and they could just you know um, check it out and able to apply in the organizations.
And with this, we want to kind of summarize like, um, what we have like, uh, discussed today. So the main you know, goal we want to uh, show today is the project code nest. So we have you know, open source this high quality code data sets you know, to help you know, uh, innovate and benchmarking you know, um, code and you know, able to help us you know, do um, more uh, for you know, developers. And we also introduced you know, like, uh, one of the open source you know, AI system stack, Machine Learning Exchange to help you know, data scientists and uh, developers to exchange the assets they have developed right, for CodeNet so they could actually improve and create more use cases um, that help developers to you know, have easier jobs. And with this kind of new use cases, right, uh, if, uh, it could also generate new business value, such as for legacy codes, right, uh, we could actually um, use kind of like um, when, when a researcher kind of research this data set could you know, apply on um, language trans um, uh, code language translations, a business um, kind of use case could kind of like um, view view this uh, as like uh, some you know potential um, uh, business value and use this model to help us migrate legacy codes or like outdated uh, code into a more modernized version of it. And this is like the powerful of like um, you know this code uh, code net data sets and having a uh, shareable, you know, AI system stack could help, you know, developer and data scientists to, you know, enhance the ecosystems. And that is the, you know, end of the sections. Is there any question in the audience? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, so, um, you said it supports two different languages. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, I have a very simple use case of setting up my, uh, you know, CI CD pipeline. Right. I see, I see. I, so the question is like how this data set could help you, you know, um, on your day-to-day -day work, right? On, let's say for CICD, could it help you auto-generate codes or could it help you optimize codes, right? So, um, you know, the, the main focus on this is just the data sets, right? So there's a various amount of use cases you could do. Uh, of course, the, the very common use case, right, um, like, like what I have shown with the um, mass language model, is actually how you, you know, complete your code. Let's say if you, um, you know, type like one line of code, you try to predict the next line of code you could go into write. So that's just code completions. And uh, of course, there's like other use cases you could do like code um, optimizations where you have like a whole function of code. You have how you, you know, measure the runtime and try to optimize it. Um, that is another use case that we see in researcher and um, as you know more research have came out we could see like um, more use cases could be in generated right um, especially like with the new concept of foundation models um, if, with this kind of large data set we could create like, uh, a single model that could you know apply in the multiple use cases like completion and summarization uh, so you mean say it helps in completion as well uh, it could yeah it could Um, so we are not open sourcing like a completion models. I right? just to be clear, we are open sourcing the data sets. We're just showing like several, several use cases you could do it, right? Um, of course, like, for completion model, you could use a sample of multiple deep learning models, right? One just you know masking, just help you you know tokenize it, help you predict the next you know most likely tokens, and then you have you know you could create a generative model that use that output, right? Generating new codes or complete your new codes or you know, summarize your new codes, right? It could be a sample models, or of course in the new research field, right? Foundation model is being very popular to just generalize all the you know, NLP tasks. So that could be another approach where you know, a lot of researchers have you know, um, done, but like, as, you know, as, as a lot of research, right? Um, some of them are just kind of full of concepts. So um, that's why we kind of provide this new you know, corner data set for people to create more pro concepts. So it, they could discover a new way on creating discount models. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Have you guys given any thought to running this over like Git repos versus CodeNet? Um, so we do see a you know, scenario of code repo. Uh, repo. So we, we're scrapping code on Go repos. You just don't have like a, a good idea on how you know, the test case is, is being run, right? right? Um, because when you scrap code on GitHub, um, you have to 
guess like is is this test co uh, is this test case uh, able to like verify that functions right because you cannot kind of scan all the ci cd like how it ran behind the scenes you only could kind of like get the code you know out of githubs you know, like it could be under maintained it could be like um untested so it's just you know sure. that is one of the you know, challenges some of the larger repos if you run them in a like in a linear fashion starting from the beginning towards the end you catch the ability to find the uh, especially if it's like a kernel where they use fixes tags and stuff you can start mapping things like fixes and and commits in the future to bugs in the past and you can and you can tell then you can go back and back correlate what's buggy and what's good and and then use that to help train it would seem like that would be a good idea or a good place to start somewhere like that right i mean that is definitely a, a very good use case right to just you know like track you know different commits um i, I think right now we um there's no good automated way to you know generate that kind of uh, data sets um right so um I think with the CodeNet, right, the concept is we collaborate with different kind of like, um, you know, like coding challenge websites to just, you know, like with that, we, we know that uh, like the environment they ran, how much, like, yeah, we have a more like um, controlled environments. So we kind of like easy to collect all this kind of data from various angles where you're going to get from GitHub. There's more challenges on how like, you need the developers to understand like different like Git commits, right? And able to like understand and reason in them and put and, and label them to like, re like useful data sets. So that's, I think what, that's one of the challenge on, you know, collecting the monkey hubs. Yeah, is there any questions? Yeah. If not, yeah, you could go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so, so my next question is, instead of doing natural language processing, have you thought about doing a specific language preprocessing? To break the code down into its actual, like, preprocessor elements? Like it, like the uh, the actual compiler would see, and then process it that way. Would that help, or would that work? Um, so, I mean, that could be a very interesting use case, right, to do it in uh, preprocessing. So, um, I think I think right now what we have, um, so what we have open source focus uh, we, when we focus on the open source side, we focus on just developing, uh, like de deliver this like um, data sets. Um, and we do like want to see that people like you to provide us more use cases to l give us more idea how you apply these data sets, right? Let's say on just on the compiler side, we, we you know never have use cases on that, so that could be a very interesting use case. And you know, feel free to you know submit issues or let us know uh, on GitHub, and we will take a look into it. Yep. Are there any questions? Yes, go ahead. Oh yeah, if you want to like uh, deploy a machine learning exchange, uh, you could just go to the um, machine learning exchange website. Um, I could, you know, like, show you uh, up after. I think it's also at the uh, ml-exchange.org. Uh, um, so I think the only thing you need is just a Kubernetes cluster and access to public um, networks. So everything is open source, so we host everything on um, um, on public registry, so you can actually just download them, and uh, we have like um, like customization installation, and also um, just pure YAML in installation. You could just apply it, and it will just install in your cluster. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, so the data sets also include test cases, right? Oh yeah, the data half of the problem have like test cases, well robust test cases. So Yeah, you could also apply that use case as well. Yeah, that that's like the the concept we we want to provide user. Like you also could you, you know provide uh, generate tests and verify them. You know, um, and and th that's what we are hoping. You know, like like people like developers able to you know give us more idea how you apply this data sets right into various different use cases. Are there any uh, other questions? Yes. Oh, um, yeah, I, I think I could uh, kind of show the list of um, artifacts we have, like, kind of, like, published. Um, so on the official published um, 
uh, assets, right? We actually like have to go over each of the data set and make sure they are uh, like uh, license compliance with all the open source licensing. Uh, so behind the scene, we do work with some like lawyers to make sure like um, we could also use an open source and not able to have legal problems. So that's why like um, this is a very manual process when you have like want to publish a models, let's say a models, especially a data set that involves you know like um, you know kind of like sensitive um, data. It has to go over like some like uh, con consensus process where uh, it has to be approved and able to comply with all the open source license and able to like apply on you know all different kind of projects on you know open source. And, and sorry to follow up very quickly. Do you think that the open source licenses that exist today are sufficient to be um, responsible for managing the rights of the artifacts that you have? Think Apache assigned to a model is that sufficient, or did you find any weaknesses in, in there? Um, so, so for your questions, right? Uh, in, in the existing licensing, um, I, I don't work with, like, I don't, you know, actually work with the licensing, you know, team. Um, so we are only like, um, so we you, initially we kind of came up with, you know, a list of licenses like Apache to uh, MIT and and. These are the, the common license used in open source, and we give it to the licensing team, and you know, see like what are the list of data sets we could open source them uh, within these licenses, and, and that's the, the approach we came with. The other way around, where we have a data set and you want to, you know, um, you know, certify for a particular license, I think that is more challenging. You might have to like dive deeper on how, you know, that data is being used or being processed. So um, that that will have, have to follow up with the licensing team. To, to get back with you. Yeah. Are there any other questions? If not, yeah, thank you very much for joining these sessions. Thanks, everyone. Yes. Oh, thank you.